Father, tonight, as we go over this lesson, help us to see the great controversy that goes on within our world and how much the enemy seeks to destroy us and to keep us away from you. And I, I just pray that your will be done, and I pray that you will help us to be faithful to you, to hear your word, and I pray that as your spokesperson that all is said and done would bring honor and glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, quiz, true or false? The book of Daniel reveals that there is a great controversy going on between Christ and Satan. The book of Daniel reveals that there is a great controversy going on between Christ and Satan. Number two, Jesus Christ is the one who led Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. Some of you are looking at me awful, like, what? Just remember, we talked about this last week. Jesus Christ is the one who led Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. I didn't say what we talked about, but we did talk about something. Okay? Number three, Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man. Both fully God and fully man. Number four, only God can perform miracles. Therefore, whenever I discover a supernatural miracle, I know it's from God. Only God can perform miracles. So when I see a supernatural miracle, I know it is from God. Number five, my only safety against Satan's deceptions is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and to test everything by the Bible only. Now don't say your answers because you might call somebody else to put the wrong answer. Do I? Number five, my only safety against Satan's deceptions is to have a personal relationship with Jesus and to test everything by the Bible and the Bible only. Number six, is it okay to keep just eight of the Ten Commandments? Is it okay to keep just eight of the Ten Commandments? That's true and false. Yes or no, true or false. And number seven, is it my prerogative to toss out the commandments I do not like? Okay, you ready for answers? How many of you think you got them all right? Need to see, are you getting ready to see it? How many of you think you got them all right? How many of you think you got some of them wrong? How many of you wouldn't admit it even if you did? <laughs> okay, number one, before we answer, Raphael wants to see it again. The book of Daniel reveals that there is a great controversy going on between Christ and Satan. Okay? How many of you think that is false? How many of you think it's true? It's true. All right, we'll continue to talk about that tonight. In fact, we will talk about it a lot of times because it is all through the book of Daniel. Number two, Jesus Christ is the one who led Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. Okay, how many of you think that's true? Good. Then you remembered what I told you, and you remember studying your lesson. I should ask you, how many of you studied your lesson before you got here tonight? Good. I won't ask how many didn't. Okay, just that. <laughs> but I didn't ask them to raise their hand, Carl. All right. Uh, so, yes, remember we talked about the fact that Jesus is the rock that they drank from. It's in the New Testament. Jesus is and was the principal creator of this whole planet. Not that the Father and the, and the Holy Spirit weren't there, but he was, he's consistent in the New Testament as being the principal creator. Okay? And so um, he was the one. 
In fact, I told you my interpretation is this, and I, don't, I know you don't have to believe man's interpretation, but this is my thought as I, as I read this information and I study it. And that is, and I think I told you last week, the fact that Jesus was the principal creator when sin fell, he said, look, I take the heat. The buck stops here. I will die for man. Okay? And so it makes sense that he was there. And it makes sense that he was the one who walked with them through the, the wilderness. It's to make, it just makes sense. Uh, Jesus didn't just come to planet Earth as a baby. All right? Number three. Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man. It's true. Number four, only God can perform miracles. Therefore, when I discover a supernatural miracle, I know it's from God. How many think it's true? It's good because it's false. Because remember, we said even the devil can perform miracles. And so the way that you know that a miracle is not of God is if the people or the person or the entity creating that miracle is not upholding the word of God, that miracle's not from God. Does that make sense? Make sense? Like Michael said, if he says, do like this. Okay. Number five. My only safety against Satan's deception is to have a personal relationship with Jesus and to test everything by the Bible and the Bible only. It's true. And then number six, you should, got, you should have gotten these if you didn't get anything else. Is it okay for me to just keep eight out of the Ten Commandments? False. And then, is it okay, is it my prerogative to toss out the commandments I don't like? No. In other words, it's God's word. And have you ever heard that old phrase? Uh, somebody will be talking about something they need to do and say, man, you can't do that. That's written in stone. Have you ever heard that phrase? You know where that came from? Ten Commandments. It was written in stone. That's why it's permanent. And so it's God's word. Okay. If you let someone else tell, uh, tell you how to think, you're going to be lost. If you let someone else do your thinking for you, I should say, you're going to be lost. You have to think. And you have to ask God, and you have to study, and you have to read, and you have to do this. I, I remember when I first uh, became a Christian, and I wanted so bad for the pastor to show me what he was doing, how he did this, because I, I just like what he did, and, and I just wanted to follow him around and learn how to do this. Well, I'm a pastor now, and I know he didn't have time to do that. But the point is, is that I also learned this. If I was ever going to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I had to be on my knees in the Word on a daily basis. So if you think that you can avoid that, that you can avoid it, you're playing with fire. No pun intended. Okay? Okay. Today's lesson, the controversy begins. Actually, it had begun a long time before that, but... The focal point of Daniel, we've said many times, the great controversy is at the head of this book, and it is the theme of this book, and also the time of the end, the time of the end. So there's going to be a great controversy, not just in Daniel's day, but even at the time of the end, and that's what we need to remember. And that's why you can look in your life and you can see that there is a great controversy going on. There's something always happening and if you're walking with Jesus you're going to see that you're going to see that and I've had one lady tell me well I'm not walking with Jesus because I don't want any of that I said but just think about the end what you're going to think you can walk through the great controversy with Jesus and he will guide your life and in the end you'll have no more controversy and you'll have eternal life. But if you choose the opposite, then you probably still are going to have controversy. 
but you're not going to know who to blame it on. And when it's all over, you're going to lose everything. What do you want to do? I want to walk with Jesus. Well, the great controversy theme, and there are two main issues in Daniel and Revelation, two main issues, and those issues are one, who will you worship? Who are you going to worship? There are only two sources. You can worship the enemy or you can worship God. That's your choice. And you can't say, I want to straddle the fence. You can't say, oh, when I think time's getting towards the end, I'll be okay. Listen, that is not going to work. You have two choices. Who will you worship? And secondly, who will you obey? So Daniel Revelation is about worship and obedience. And it talks about the worship and the meeting. So we're going to see some of this tonight. But the question is tonight is, who are you going to worship and who are you going to obey? You say, well, I don't worship anybody. I want to just take care of myself. Okay, well, then you worship yourself. That's still the devil's tactic. There is no middle road. You have one choice or the other, and you get to choose. That choice is yours. That choice means that you can choose whether you have eternal life or you can choose whether you have eternal damnation. And here's the thing I want you to remember, that God loves you so much that he gave you free choice. Free choice. You can choose what you want. And he loves you so much, he will not take that freedom of choice away from you. He will not take it away from you. Even if you choose death, he will respect your freedom of choice. Because he loves you. He gave you a gift. He will not take it away from you. Because to be a friend of God, you must make choices that will lead you closer to God. And if you don't make those choices, your choices will lead you somewhere else. Do we know where that is? And the more people lean towards evil, the more evil they become. The more dastardly their deeds. So who will you worship and who will you obey? So we're going to the first um, question there. Or just before we get to the first question, that, that little paragraph just above there um, talks about the two issues, worship and obedience. And in other words, the point that it's making is that in the last days of earth's history, that's going to be what the issue is. Who are you going to worship? Who are you going to obey? And that will be something that you will have to make a decision on. And the truth is, is to make no decision is to make a decision. So if you make no decision, you have made a decision to worship the enemy and not God. And that is serious business. And I'm just trying to tell you tonight that it's a major issue of conflict in the last days of verse history. So let's go to question number one. It says, name the specific instances in the book of Daniel where the issue of worship and obedience illustrate the great controversy theme. Well, if you looked all those up, one of them is that about what Daniel would eat. Yes, what would Daniel eat? And we'll talk about that later. But the point is, is that Daniel knew what God was telling him. And if he did not do what God was telling him, then he was doing what the king was telling him, which was against what God was telling him, which means that he would disobey God. He couldn't do that. Who will you worship? Who will you obey? Daniel chapter 3 and verse 10. Worshiping the image. Falling down and worshiping that image. When the music played, they were to fall down and worship. And they did not do that because to fall down and worship would be breaking what commandment? Second commandment. No, no images. Don't worship them. Don't bow down to them. And so they made that choice and they stood they went through the fiery furnace. We'll talk about that on another lesson. But anyway, it was about worship and obedience. Who are you going to worship? Who are you going to obey? And then in Daniel 4.25, we have Nebuchadnezzar's insanity. And you say, how can that have anything to do with worship and obedience? Well, I'll tell you how it does. And that is this. If you read the chapter, the fourth chapter of 
of Daniel. It's the only chapter in the Bible or in the book of Daniel that Daniel didn't write. It's a testimony of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was walking and learning about God. God was walking him along, guiding his life. He's a convert. We'll talk about this story later. And so when God was talking to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, re, re, uh, helping Nebuchadnezzar realize that these, there are things that, that he needs to do, he had a choice to make. Follow God, do what God said, and things would work out. Don't follow God, and you are going to find yourself crawling around like an animal for seven years. Choice to make. Who will you worship? Who will you obey? God allowed him to make the wrong choice. But he was an adamant follower of God. And we'll learn more about that as we move along as well. And then on letter D, it says, Belshazzar's defiling of the Lord's vessels. Those vessels that they took from, from Jerusalem were made for the worship of who? Of God. So if they took them and they used them to worship pagan gods, that was an issue of worship. Who are you going to worship? They made a decision. We're worshiping our pagan gods. But we're going to do it in the face of you, God, and we're going to worship our gods. Because our gods have to be strong because we're the ones who took over you in the first place. Hmm. God sent him a little message. Written in what? Right in the stone. On the wall. Many, many tickle you farson. We'll talk about that lesson too. So, and then the last one is uh, Daniel's praying. You can't pray to anybody, Daniel, for the next 30 days but me. To do that, Daniel would have to sever his relationship with God, wouldn't he? Just not pray. And you say, well, yeah, but he, he could have gone in the closet. He could have closed the windows. They would never have known, right? Yeah, well, the, so could the three guys in the fiery furnace. They could have bent down to tighten up their sandals a little bit, just make it look like they were, you know, just they weren't worshiping. They were just going to make it, they didn't want to look obvious. So we would we'll just tie our shoes here. Who would know? God would know. Because there's nothing that you do that God doesn't know what you're thinking. And so he would know that you're trying to get out of it instead of standing up for him. And by trying to get out of it, you see, what you do is you don't trust God to take you through the situation. Right? So, so here you see Daniel's obedience to God and his worship to God is continually threatened all throughout the book. And the issue is clear. Daniel knows it. Who will you worship? Who will you obey? Who will you follow? You see, governments may come along and try to tell you how to worship God, but they don't have that right. We need to be following God. And so Daniel's point in the last days is that there are going to be issues that we're going to face. And we're going to have to make a choice. And you might think that nobody will know your choice. But angels know your choice. God knows your choice. And your choices are written in the books of heaven. Who will you worship? Who will you obey? So Daniel decides he's going to worship God. He's going to follow God. And that's what he's going to do. And this whole book is talking about Daniel taking a stand for God. You remember that little song, Dare to Be a Daniel? What would you be? Number two, it says, How do the, fair, how do the prophecies of Daniel foretell the issue of worship and obedience? How did they foretell it? How did, what did you come up with there? Now, I'm going to tell you, take your Bible, open it to the first chapter of Daniel, because that's mostly what we're covering in right now, tonight, is the first chapter of Daniel. You get to look at some of these. 
But this particular verse comes from Daniel 7, but it says, um, the, talking about the prophecies, and Daniel's talking about a power that would speak pompous words against God. Is that blatant, blatant um, rebellion or what? Okay? So this power, which we'll talk about later in Daniel 7, is going to speak great words against the Most High. And he would think to change times and laws. Did you ever think that you did something and then realize later you didn't do it? Well, that's what this power is going to do. It thinks it's going to change it. But one day it's going to realize uh, you don't have the power to do that. No matter how many times you tell people you have that power, you have not that power. And so this, this again is Daniel 7 is speaking great words against the Most High. It's an issue of obedience. So in ancient Babylon, the issue is, who will you worship? Who will you obey? In the end time, which Daniel is all about, the end time, the issue is, who will you worship? Who will you obey? Who will you follow? And Daniel 7 says that there's going to be a power that's going to think to change times and laws. And we have to be concerned about that, don't we? So let's go and let's look at Daniel's captivity for a little bit here. Let's see how all this plays out. Because this is where the controversy begins. This is where it all starts. And see, this test in Daniel chapter 1... It seems like it is just, mm, yeah, that's, not, that's just a little thing. What you going to eat? It is. It's mild. Your lesson says that. But listen to this. It says there, right there, just before number three, says only those who pass the minor test will ever pass the major test. There's a reason why they have a minor league team and they have a major league team. Because in the minor leagues, you learn how to play real ball. And when you learn that, you go to the major leagues. And so a lot of times we say, well, that's just a little test. Well, listen, little tests lead to big tests. God doesn't throw you into a big test right off the bat. Minor league to major league. And only those who pass in the minor league will go to the major league. And the point that I'm trying to make with this is that we need to be faithful to God all the time. All the time. Because if we're faithful to God all the time, what's going to happen to us is that God is going to take us to a point where we can stand and we can do what is right. Not because we're afraid but because we know what God wants us to do, and we're going to stand up for God. We're going to do what God asks us to do. Who will you worship? Who will you obey? Who will you worship? Who will you obey? Um, number three. Oh, here's something. Only those who pass the minor test will ever pass the major test. I forgot I had it on the screen. All right. Number three. What did Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, do to Jerusalem, the city of God? What did he do? He besieged it. He took over it. He, he captured the city. And you know, in those days, if you captured a city, then your God was more superior than their God. Hmm. Think about that. Now you understand why they think they could do these things in Daniel 5. We'll talk about that later. So they besiege it, and then it says, Who, though, who was it that allowed Nebuchadnezzar to capture the city in the first place? It was God, wasn't it? So God allowed a pagan king to go in and take over his city so that he could show his people, teach them a lesson about something they had forgotten, that there was only one God that they could trust in. And so God allows it to happen. And question number five says, why did God allow Judah to be taken captive by 
Nebuchadnezzar. I want you to take your Bibles. Let's go to Jeremiah 2 and verse 11 and 13. Jeremiah 2, verse 11 and 13. This is really a sad story here. And it could be our story if we don't choose to follow God. You hear me? But in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 11, it says this. Has a nation changed its gods? Which are not gods? Is that a question? And what is it asking? Have you changed gods? Changed gods with gods who are not gods? Have you done that? But my people have changed their God, their, uh, changed their glory. For what does not profit? Worship anyone other than God is not profitable. That's what it's saying. And that's what the children of Israel had done. It says, be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold that can hold no water. What does it mean they couldn't hold water? Broken cisterns, that was their body. They have become broken bodies. They can't hold the word. They can't hold the water of life. They can't hold God's word. They're broken. Why were they broken? Because they changed God's. And they chose a God who could not protect them, a God who could not deliver him, deliver them. And so they were involved in false worship, and they were disobedient, and they were and that disobedience led them right into captivity. It's amazing, isn't it? Remember, you can walk under the umbrella and not get wet with God, but if you decide to go it alone, you will get wet. Make sense? So, anyway, let's see what's next on the screen here because it seems like, oh, I didn't put it on there, did I? The nation has changed its gods and they had forsaken me. So that's what they had done. All right. And they were broken cisterns. If I forget to change the slide, just say change. <laughs> okay. Because I get excited about this, and sometimes I forget to change the slides. And I can talk about it all day long. Who seems to be winning the conflict as the book of Daniel opens? Back to Daniel chapter 1. Who seems to be winning this conflict? Who is it? Babylon seems to be winning. I mean, you know, you think about it over, the, over in Ukraine when it first started happening. Who seemed to be winning the war? The Russians. But the Ukrainians started fighting. And now, over 10,000 Russian soldiers have, at least they say, have been killed. For what? Pride? Yeah. Greed? Yeah, and there's some ego in there too. All for what they want. And so God says, you have to make a choice. And so Babylon comes in, and it seems like in the beginning, as Daniel begins, that, that, that God has just been beat up. He's lost this battle. But the battle ends with God winning. Sometimes it's good to read the last chapter first to know what it says. And so, so the people of God seem to be destroyed, but they aren't. Question 7 says, what kind of people did Nebuchadnezzar choose from among the captives of Judah to be educated in the schools of Babylon? What kind of people did he choose? Just think about that. If you were a king going in to, to take a city 
for instance, in the war that's going on right now, they have what they call filtration camps. And I thought, well, that's a nice way to say something else, but filtration camps. So they go in and they take these people. They want to find out who's going to be loyal to Russia. So the Babylonians go in and they take these people who are the best and the brightest. And they take young people because they can change their... You know what, they, what do they say about us, those of us who are old? What's that statement? Do you remember I knew you would know it. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. So they teach the young pups. See? So they go in and they, they grab these young people. And so who does it say that they grab? It says the king's descendants. So think about it. Daniel was probably a descendant of a king. He was destined to be a king. Think about that. What would you be like if somebody came in And just kind of mess up your life royally. What would you think? But not Daniel. Not Daniel. And they took children that were, um, had no blemish. That means that these were the best and the brightest. And they uh, basically um, were gifted with wisdom and knowledge. They had been taught well. And they understood the King James says science, but they were, they were quick to understand. They understood things. So he was choosing the best and the brightest Judeans to bring into his kingdom because what they would do is they would, they would take these people and they would educate them and then they would send them back to the country to work for them and make sure everything worked okay. So that's what he did. And so for that... The Bible says that they got a free education. But it says, how long was this education process going to last? How long was it to last? So they got a three-year education at the University of Babylon, free of charge. All your meals, everything taken care of. I mean, you know, you didn't have to have student loans. You were just good to go, right? But it was kind of a re-education because they were going to teach you about Babylonian gods and Babylonian this and Babylonian that. So out of all these people, now listen, there were probably over a million people. And I'm probably shy on that big time that were carried over into captivity. But of all those people, there were only four young people that were listed. And who were those young people? What did you put down there? What does the Bible say? Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, you probably don't even know these young people by these names. But the point is, is this was their names. And they were godly names. They were names that told them about themselves and about the God that they served. But what did Babylon do when they brought them in? What did they do? The, they changed all their names. And so they gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. And that's what most of us know them by. Shadrach, Meshach, and some people know it by, to bed we go. Abednego, okay? Abednego, okay? And so they attempted to totally change their understanding. But remember, Daniel's name was, it meant, God is my judge. God is my judge. And now they're going to name him Belshazzar, Belteshazzar, which means Bel protects the king. Wow. They don't cut it, does it? And then they took Hananiah, and they took Hananiah, and Hananiah's name means Jehovah is gracious, but now he's given another name that represents the Babylonian name of who? Marduk, that's right. And then there was uh, Michel. Michel was um, one who belongs to God. I mean, just think about these names. Now, when you named your children, did you pick out names that meant something really special? When my daughter was born... And she was adopted, and the day we went to get her, 
I had already picked out her name. And I named her Jessica, which means God's gift. Because it was an absolute miracle that we were able to adopt this child without any money transactions, period. And I could tell you the story. And so it, to me, when I look at her, it was God's gift. And so I wanted her to know that. You are God's gift. So I told her the story and repeated the story and repeated the story. Because I wanted her to remember that. So Daniel and his par- Daniel's parents and, and these three Hebrew par- parents, they gave them names that reminded them every day about God. But here now they're taking their names, their their God names away, and they're giving them pagan names. Pagan names that would tend to lead them away from what God is saying, from what God wants for them. And then when you get to Azariah, they gave him the name Abednego. Azariah, Jehovah helps. Hmm. Servant of the God Nebu is what they changed his name to. How in the world did Daniel and his friends, how do they face these tests? How are they tested? I mean, just think about this. You're there. You probably came from royalty. You have been whisked off to another country. And by the way, they didn't take you in a jet plane. They didn't take you in an ox cart even. You walked. And so here they are. Here they are. How do they survive all this? Question um, 11 says, what was to be the diet for those who were selected for this special education? Now think about this, folks. The king brings them in. He wants to do the best for them. Now you have to understand this. He's not after doing something that's going to hurt them. He wants to give them the best he's got. But if the best you got is not godly, it's like the worst you got, right? And so they come in and the king gives them uh, his meat and his wine. So that seems like something that was really, really, really good. Well... Romans 12, 11 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God had something better for Daniel and his friends. Something better. And so what had God told them about the food and drink that they put in their body. What did he tell them about this? What did he say to them? What was the, what's the Bible say? In Proverbs 20 and verse one, it says, wine is a what? Strong drink is a brawler and whosoever is led astray by it is not what? Wise. Well, it goes on. Do not look on the wine when it is red when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. Smooth does not mean it's the best. Okay? So they knew this. They knew this. I don't think, let's see, is there another one we got up here? Nope. So they knew this. They knew what God had said about wine, about food. They knew this stuff. And so they were determined that they were going to walk with God. And it says in question number 13, it says, What food had God forbidden the Israelites to eat that might have been on the king's dining room table? Unclean animals. Unclean animals. We'll talk about this later. That was there. More than likely, that was on their table. And then, Question 14 says, what decision did Daniel and his friends make? Before we go there, think about this.
God was asking them to stand up for what was right, even in troublesome times. And so to eat what was on the king's table would be disobedient to God. And yet at the same time, to, eat, to not eat what was on the king's table and be obedient to God would be to be disobedient to the king. Do you understand the, con- the, the, the rock, between the rock and the hard place that they were in? So they knew that God would take care of them, right? And so they decide we're following, we're following God. And that was the decision they made to follow God. They were not going to eat anything that God had told them not to. That was their decision in Daniel 1 and verse 8. And it says, but Daniel purposed in his heart. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This is the most important text in this whole lesson. They purposed in their heart that he, well, Daniel, he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. What did he do? He purposed in his heart. He was going to worship God. He was not going to worship any pagan authorities or entities. He didn't care that he was there, and he wasn't going to do it. He was going to follow God. Hmm. Wonder where we are with that in our lives today. Have we purposed in our hearts to do that which God has asked us to do? You see, the outward issue is to not to eat the king's food, not to eat the king, drink the king's wine. But the real issue is loyalty to God over loyalty to man. I'm going to follow God even if I don't get the promotion I need. I'm going to follow God even if I I don't get this or that. I'm going to follow God. Because in the end, if I don't follow God, I'll have to learn that lesson somewhere else. And it might not be as easy. Purpose in their hearts. So there's no question about the issue of loyalty to God. It's more important than loyalty to God the king and so this conflict this this conflict between the forces of good and evil the issue is obedience obedience to god or obedience to man who will you serve who will you obey and so for daniel and god's people in the time of the end we're going to face this again Who we're going to serve? Who we're going to obey? That's why it's important to always serve God, even in the good times. Because if you don't serve Him in the good times, you won't serve Him in the bad times. You'll serve yourself. Or you'll save, try to save yourself. Okay. Three reasons Daniel refused the king's food. One, it's a violation of scriptures to eat unclean foods. Number two, they probably were improperly slaughtered. If you remember reading in the books of Leviticus, you remember that God had a special way they were to kill their animals if they were going to eat meat. He had a proper way. They probably weren't done this way for the king's table. Okay? And number three, had been sacrificed to heathen gods. More than likely, they would have been, they would have been sacrificed to heathen gods. And so what do you do with all this stuff? comes to the king's table for the best and the brightest so here's your statement we must stand for something or otherwise sooner or later we will fall for anything what are we going to do well Acts chapter 5 and verse 29 says we ought to obey God rather than man. I remember in the military when I was asked to do something that was against what I knew was right. And I had talked to my supervisor about it. And um, he said, well, you'll be here or else. I said, I just, I was bold. And I said, well, I think I'll obey God rather than man. He said, well, we'll see how God gets you out of this. I said, okay. So I walked across the bay 
to my OIC, my officer in charge, and I said to him, I told him the situation. He said, I'll take care of it. That meeting was to happen on a certain day of the week. And in that certain day of the week, we were all supposed to be there for something very important. It was a haircut inspection. We never worked on Saturdays, ever. So by the end of the week, nobody had said anything about what was going to happen. And I said, uh, we were riding in the truck to the field because I worked in Minuteman Missiles and we were working in the field and, and we were riding out because sometimes we might have to drive 200 miles to get that missile site. And so we, were, we would get there and as we were riding, we would talk and, and I said, well, hey, what happened to uh, the haircut inspection? He said, I said, oh, you didn't hear about that? I said, wasn't mentioned to me. Oh, he said, that's been called off. I said, for what? Well, they said that too many people had other things to do and they're just going to be able to do it that weekend. Let me tell you something, folks. In the military, if they want to do something, they don't care about your schedule. They don't care about anybody's schedule. They do it. And this business that nobody had the time, that doesn't cut it in the military. That is not a military excuse. I knew who answered that prayer. And when we stand for God, as small as it may be or as large as it may be, he will take care of us and he will take care of you. Let's see. Let's go to the next one here. I think uh, number 15. And it says, what did Daniel ask the prince of the eunuchs? Daniel has met these guys. He knows them. And they, they, he's asking them a question. He says, help me. Help me that I will not what? Defile myself. Because for Daniel to eat something that was unclean or to drink something that he wasn't supposed to drink, guess what? That was not on Daniel's plan. He was not going to do that. And so Daniel asked for an exemption. Think about this. He's a POW. And he's asking for special privileges. The average person would probably be glad with what they got. And they would eat what they could. But not Daniel. I can't defile myself. Because you see, not to ask for this would appear that he was eating it. That he was drinking it. He had to make a distinction. And, well, these guys kind of like Daniel. It says, how did the princes and the eunuchs view Daniel? What did, they, what did they think about him? They favored him. They loved Daniel. Daniel was a nice guy. And they just liked him. But there was a problem. And it was a king. And it says, how did the chief of the eunuchs respond to Daniel's request? What, did it, what does it say? Who did he fear? <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. Because think about it. This guy's in charge of Nebuchadnezzar's house. I mean, of, of, of Daniel and, the, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's in charge of their health. And if they get to looking peakish and just weak and all this kind of stuff, guess what? It could be off with his head. So he's scared. Because he doesn't know the God that Daniel knows. And so Daniel gives him a suggestion. And he says, what test did Daniel suggest? What was it? A 10-day test. Now, I want to tell you something, folks. I, I don't think that 10 days would normally make the difference between this issue. But there was somebody else involved in this. God was involved in this, okay? And, uh, I mean, anybody in here ever been on a diet? Come on now, I know better than that. I know that. So you've been on diets before, 10 days. Yeah, there might be some movement that goes somewhere with it, but I'm just telling you that not like this. Not like this. There was a God involved in this who knew the end from the beginning. I'm not saying that it didn't work because Daniel tried it. I'm saying that God was in it. And Daniel trusted God to take care of it. And so what did he ask for? What did Daniel and his friends request to eat during those 10 days? Vegetables and water. Now, 
In those days, to be a little on the heavy side proved to be that you were healthy. So were they going to be uh, nice and plump at the end of those 10 days? I don't think so. They were going to be a little skinnier than when they started. But the point is, is that what God did for them has made them look better, right? That's what God did. And so that's what they were asking for a basic vegetarian diet. And so the New International Version even says, Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. So Daniel and his friends were requesting this special Ju Judean diet. Have you ever, have you, if, you, if, you, if you are a vegetarian, it is not an easy feat sometimes to go out and eat. You have to ask a lot of questions. And a lot of times I see people going out and they don't ask these questions. And I'm sitting here thinking, what would Daniel do? Daniel would know, wouldn't he, what he was getting for his meal. And so Daniel was asking and Daniel wanted to have, number one, he wanted to have a clear mind because if you're drinking wine all day long, hmm, how clear is your mind going to be? And see, folks, you know, you, you, when, you, when you are eating healthfully, you can have a better connection with God. Did you know that? And you can hear him. You can, you can feel his presence. There's just something about it when you're eating more healthy. And so Daniel wanted the best because when he was having to make some really difficult decisions, he wanted to make sure his mind was clear. That he could hear God speaking to him. So, let's go to uh, Daniel wins the test. At the time, at the end of those ten, ta ten days, how much better was Daniel and his friends? Ten times better. The king examined them. They were ten times better. And um, so, um, number 21 says, Because of Daniel's faithfulness, what did God give him? Knowledge. Skill. Being able to understand visions and dreams. Did that prove to be a necessary help for Daniel? Yes, it did. It also proved, that we'll see later, the ability to bring conversion to a pagan king. How about that? So, the knowledge and the skill that Daniel and his friends were going to need just came at the right time. So, because of their strict obedience, because of their, their trusting in the principles of God, God honored them, and they became obedient, more obedient as every, as every day went by. Question number 22. What happened? Trying to go back and make it work. Ah. Okay, we got that one. Mm, I'll have to check this out. You know, one day I had my slides working and there was no slides at all. And some of you know that. I went home and all the slides were there. So, all right. Don't have the answer to that. But number 22 says, when they took their final exam, how much better did Daniel and his friends find themselves? Ten times better. Does God always honor obedience? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. I'm seeing what this is going to do next. Actually, number 22 is coming up. That was number 21 visions and dreams okay 10 times better the bible says i'll have to check this out you know this worked fine today when i was in here so the reason they were 10 times better 
was not because they were just some really strong, you know, special character person. That was, that was not it. Their character was whose character? It was God's character. And so they weren't superior individuals. They were just godly individuals. They were obedient to God, and God took care of them. So when we get to Daniel 6, these same Hebrews are going to have to be faithful again. They're going to have to be faithful again. And those who compromise, they're going to be in trouble. And in Daniel, uh, the third chapter, the fiery furnace, Remember, they could have just easily bent over and said, hey, hey guys, let's just tighten our sandals. Let's just come on. And they could have done that, but God would have known. When we get to Daniel 6, Daniel could have closed his windows. He could have prayed. But what would he have said? I don't trust God to take care of me. So Nobody has to know. I'll close the windows and I'll pray here by myself. They couldn't have proven anything. But God would have known, right? So if we can't remain loyal to God when the tests are easy, how do we stay loyal to God when the tests get difficult? So that last line there on that page says, if we cannot be obedient in this time, we will never be obedient when real trouble comes. It's now or never, isn't it? Who will you trust? Who will you obey? Fact. If we cannot or will not be obedient now, we will never be obedient when trouble comes. So number 23 says, do you wish to be loyal and obedient to God in the time of prosperity that you too might be loyal and true to God when times of difficulty comes? Is that your desire? Okay, we have a response question. First of all, it says, if you said yes to question number 23... What's the secret of that success? It is your will, but God supplies the power. Can a leopard change his spots? Nope. And neither can man change his sinful ways without God. So, sum it up. We've learned from tonight's lesson what? The issues of Daniel and in the Bible are worship and obedience. Who will you worship? Who will you obey? God is in control. You see, the king thought he was in control. He won the battle. He brought him home. But the truth is, we found out that it was God who let him win the battle. It's like a thrown ball game, right? Right? So they went home with their big head, but God said, watch this, what's going to happen. Just watch. And so he helped the king to see who really was in control, right? And number three, God's people have always been and will always be in the minority. We will never be the majority. We'll be the minority. You understand that? Because it's not popular to follow what God says. But the hope, the satisfaction of knowing that you're walking with a God who can take care of anybody. And sometimes you may find yourself wondering why God didn't take care of that somebody sometime. But the truth is, God can do it. God may have something for you to learn. Nothing comes to us that God doesn't allow and most of the time, it's so we can learn something from it. So he can weed out a little bit of selfishness and put in a little more righteousness. That's not yours, but it'll be his. Response question with your little boxes there. You ready? 
Is it your desire to be loyal to God in times of prosperity that you may also be loyal to God in times of adversity? Box one, put a check. And number two, if you would like for me to pray that God will give you victory in your life, put a check in box two. Our next lesson, conflict through the centuries. We're going to see this play out the next time we're together. That'll be what night? And Wednesday, after Wednesday, when's the next lesson? Saturday morning, 11 o'clock. Saturday morning, 11 o'clock, okay? All right, so we'll, we'll see you then, and we'll see you on Wednesday. All right, let's see. I don't think, I think I did put this up here. Yes, we did. Next lesson is four. All right, let's have prayer together. Father in heaven, we just thank you for your love for us, and we just ask that you would help us to walk faithfully with you. Help us, Lord, to worship you, to trust you, to not trust in man, but to trust in you. As we go our separate ways, guide our lives, help us to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.